The Ethiopian Prime Minister says his landlocked country will get direct access to a port. Abiy Ahmed wants to increase economic growth, but how far is he prepared to go? And what could Ethiopia's neighbours offer? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Ethiopia has been landlocked since Eritrea gained its independence in 1993. For 30 years, it's been dependent upon its neighbours, especially Djibouti, for access to ports and international shipping routes. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says the high costs are unsustainable. He's reportedly said that Ethiopia will secure direct access to a port peacefully or, if necessary, by force. What does he mean? And what are the implications for neighbouring nations? We'll be discussing all of this in a few moments with our guests. But first, a report from Victoria Gatenby. The port of Djibouti is situated on one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. 95% of Ethiopia's imports and exports pass through here. Ethiopia has been landlocked since Eritrea gained independence in 1993. The port of Asab handled two-thirds of Ethiopia's trade for five years until war broke out between the neighbours in 1998. Since then, it's relied on other ports in the region. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says the status quo is costly and unsustainable. He wants Ethiopia to have a port of its own. He reportedly told a meeting of investors and businessmen last week that Ethiopia will get a port by peaceful means, but if that fails, it'll use force. In a bid to tap into shipping routes, the government's recently started negotiations with its neighbours and has reportedly offered Eritrea a 30% stake in the national carrier in exchange for direct access to its port. Ethiopia has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. In its 2023 World Economic Outlook, the International Monetary Fund predicted GDP will increase 13.5% this year. But the government says development is being held back. It seems determined to address this, something neighbouring countries will be following closely. Victoria Gatenby for Inside Story. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Addis Ababa, we're joined by Kamal Hashi Mahamoud, a member of the Ethiopian Parliament. In London is Martin Plout, uh, a journalist specialising in the Horn of Africa. He's also a fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. And from Washington, D.C., we're joined by Kwaku Nuama, who is a senior lecturer and chairman of the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Programme at the American University. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Kamal Haji Mahmoud, let's start with you. Let's clear up something right from the start. Did Abiy Ahmed actually say that he'd get access to a port by peaceful means, negotiation, or by force if necessary? And if he did make those remarks, how seriously should we take them? Uh, thank you, sir, for hosting you to this show. Uh, I know, uh, like, uh, it has been uh, uh, reported by a certain British that uh, the premise has stayed by force or by peace. Uh, I, I I never heard of that in any of his speech, or uh, and I don't even expect that from the prime minister. And I don't think uh, uh, that is uh, true. It shows uh, everything he has been doing since he came to the leadership. Uh, it doesn't show that he goes for force. He's been uh, working with all the neighboring countries uh, in ending um, the peace, the cooperation. And also of a real relationship because uh, with all the neighboring countries in Serbia, we don't only share borders, we also share nationalities. Uh, a lot of uh, ethnic people who are in Serbia, we do have uh, the same uh, community in the neighboring countries. So there is no way, uh, a force would be an option, but, but the, the necessity of the port is very, uh, very clear and crucial. And I think the government uh, should find all the peaceful means. Uh, that we can really uh, make sure that each other can also access the port to make sure that, the, you know, the growing uh, nations of Serbia now are like more than 120 million uh, will be a better economic, uh, you know, uh, growing. 
All right, Martin, what do you make of this? Is this the kind of thing that Abiy Ahmed would say? And if he did say this, perhaps he was misinterpreted? Well, it is possible that he was misinterpreted, but quite frankly, if you have uh, the media in Ethiopia reporting this and it's incorrect, you would expect the uh, Ethiopian government to put out an official say statement saying, no, this is wrong, this is not what we believe. Uh, so I think we have to assume that he did say it. Um, I mean, frankly, it is slightly unhinged. Uh, you know, the, it's interesting, we've just come through a war between uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia combined just against the region of Tigray, and they weren't able to defeat the Tigrayans. They had to end up with a peace agreement, which was on both terms, shall we say, or the terms of both sides. Uh, so, you know, the idea that, that the Ethiopians are going to project force and defeat who? Eritrea, Djibouti, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, I don't know, but uh, it seems pretty unlikely. Could, could, I think could it's he... just one of those things that he might have said off the top of his head. Yeah, well, when I meant misinterpreted, could he perhaps have, have been talking about economic force? I mean, you know, there he is in charge of an economy which is, has got, what, 13.5% predicted GDP this year. A growth of GDP. Yes, but one's got to be a bit careful of that figure because... That figure really is a rebound from the war. Uh, I mean, the, the growth rates are probably only about 7 or 8% a year. Uh, I mean, they're still substantial. They're very, they're very, they're very good ro growth rates. And Ethiopia certainly needs to have access to the sea. I'm not arguing about that. But there's no need to go around uh, demanding it by force. I mean, th th there's no reason why anybody would deny him. Kwaku, what, what do you make of it? How, how seriously should we take Abiy Ahmed? I just hope that, uh, for his own sake and for the sake of Africa, that he was just joking or that he was uh, misquoted, uh, because there's no way um, that he could grab somebody's port and get away with it. It's not going to stand. Uh, it will trigger international and regional sanctions right away. And Ethiopia doesn't need this type of um, uh, disruption anymore. After the war, uh, they've, they've got a lot of work to do, and he doesn't need this kind of disruption. So who, Kwaku, would, would these comments have been aimed at in the first place? Eritrea, perhaps, or, or a domestic audience? I mean, if it was Eritrea, I thought everything, uh, relations were on a much better footing with Eritrea uh, since the, uh, the, the, the 2018 peace deal. It can only be for domestic consumption, because there is no, um, there's nothing to be gained from threatening enough his neighbors. Eritrea, he has good relations with Eritrea. Uh, the relationship is not exactly where it should be. Uh, but uh, if he has hopes of uh, using Assab, uh, which is probably the port that they want to use uh, to export um, uh, some of the stuff that's coming out of uh, central Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, uh, he cannot be threatening them. Uh, he's already trying to renegotiate deals uh, with Djibouti, which is uh, a, a place where um, he needs to focus on, and he's getting all these other deals uh, going with uh, Kenya, uh, trying to de develop a port um, uh, at Lamu, uh, in, and even Sudan. Uh, talks were started with uh, uh, with uh, the regime that has been ousted in Sudan. Uh, those are the kinds of things that he needs to be doing. If he's doing this for domestic consumption, it's dangerous. And it can also lead to uh, unintended consequences inside of Eritrea itself. Uh, the, the regime in Eritrea is unpredictable. And they can um, seize on such comments uh, to try and uh, build legitimacy by, um, you know, um, muscling out uh, some of the um, some, some of the actors that they think are um, in league with the, with the government in um, in Addis Ababa, even though they themselves seem to have worked out their relationship because they have a common um, enemy in in uh, in the TPL in the Tigray nationalists. But this can be dangerous on both sides. Uh, Come on, I mean, picking up on, on what Kwaku was saying there, uh, can Ethiopia afford a military conflict right now? I mean, it, it, you know, if, if it came to that over a port, we're, we're all saying that, that possibly it, it wouldn't go that far, that the Prime Minister's comments are to be taken with a pinch of salt here, but, but Ethiopia just simply can't afford it right now, can it? Uh, well, I, I don't think it's an issue of affordability. Ethiopia doesn't need uh, uh, conflict. So, no, the history of Ethiopia is no time that Ethiopia has been aggressive or has started any war. In all the wars it had so far, it's only kind of defending 
it's sovereignty and defending the nation. So uh, I don't see why even we assume it. Like earlier, Martin said, let's assume the Prime Minister has said, uh, like, you know, by force. And you could never say that. As, uh, as, 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 uh, as you know, uh, the other guests say, it's a very dangerous thing. And nothing going on at the ground now can justify that Prime Minister has said. Look at all the connections. Uh, you know, we're offering electricity to neighboring countries. We are giving even water to, you know, neighboring countries. You can see a lot of... Uh, Agreements happening uh, with all the regional uh, countries. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really see where this is coming. Or everything the Prime Minister has been doing since he came to power is totally opposite to this term being, you know, uh, uh, reported uh, with some other, uh, you know, uh, you know, news outlets. They're not even uh, that much official or, or you know, uh, well-known uh, media platform. So it's not an issue of affordability. Serbia will never. Uh, History doesn't tell us that they are against any kind of, uh, you know, uh, peaceful environment. It's never been aggressive. Okay. So it's not an issue of ability, but if there does make any kind of conflict, we never encounter it. Martin. It, it, and the, 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 uh, you know, this okay. government, his main policy is, you know, depending on labor relations, labor, okay. you know, mutual goals, okay. mutual relations. Um, Martin, the U.S. has recently lifted sanctions uh, after concluding that Ethiopia is no longer engaging in a pattern of gross violations of human rights. Do you think that uh, Abiy Abed would have made comments such as the ones uh, that he has uh, been reported to have made about the use of force if those sanctions had still been in place? No, it's a very good question. Uh especially as there the, the are still many examples of gross human rights uh, uh, abuses by Ethiopia, which the United States certainly knows about. I mean, you know, the, it, it is slightly odd because uh, the Chinese have just renewed the uh, rail connections with Djibouti, and they're pretty good now. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be developed. And uh, as has been said, you know, the, the, uh, the Eritrean ports of Asab and of Masawa are both available and could be used. And the, the one, the Lamu port in Kenya has been uh, talked about, and the, the, the Ethiopians have put some money into that, and it's possible that they could get something in Sudan or in even Somalia. So there are lots of options. But, I mean, you're, I'm afraid that Prime Minister Abiy tends to have these delusions of grandeur. Uh, and he make the, these strange statements. I mean, I don't know if you know, but he's just building himself a $10 billion palace. Why? The country doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. Why is he doing it? I have no hmm. idea. And, um, are, you know, and also he's talked about the, uh, starting an Ethiopian navy. I yeah. mean, where is he going to put this? I, I was going to ask you, uh, does, you know, this, this talk of using force... For a port, I mean, obviously, you know, Ethiopia needs a port for Ethiopia uh, for economic reasons. But do you think that, in Abiy Ahmed's mind, that that he has a, a, a view to to restarting an Ethiopian navy? Well, yes, absolutely. That is exactly what he has he has said. And the French at one time said that they would help him to do this and would rebuild it. I mean, the the port was started with the help of the British. In, um, in what is now independent Eritrea, and they had, I think it was three or four bases there in the islands. It had in Asab and in Masawa. And Ethiopia had a pretty good little navy. I mean, it was, it was very well run, and uh, there was, unfortunately, when Eritrea became independent, they lost the, the base. So that went, went astray. But let's not forget that Asab has been used by foreign nations to project power. The, the Saudis and the UAE both used it during the war against the, uh, the Houthi in Yemen. So uh, it's not as if Eritrea is opposed to having naval ba uh, foreign bases on its soil. It could be done, but you'd have to negotiate it. And saying you're going to use force is crazy. Uh, Kwaku, picking up on, on uh, what Martin was saying just a few moments ago, where do you think that, that Ethiopia would be looking to build its port? In Eritrea and Djibouti? Of course, Djibouti has a, a virtual monopoly over maritime trade in, in the region. Or, or this port in Somaliland, which geographically is closest uh, to, to Addis. Uh, would Bebera make sense from a strategic perspective? What are the ramifications for that, though, for Somalia uh, and Eritrea if Ethiopia were to build this port in Somaliland? So, Berbera makes sense because of proximity, but building there um, 
it's a de facto recognition of uh, the independence of uh, Somaliland, and that's not good. It's, that's not going to fly um, in, um, the Afri in the African Union. Um, so, but the way to get around that is to work within EGAD. And so you probably have to solve uh, the, uh, the secession problem uh, before Bebra becomes a real option, because it, it, you don't want Ethiopia going behind Africa Union and recognizing Somaliland uh, whilst uh, Somalia uh, is still contesting that. And so Djibouti, I think Djibouti is the other place uh, that, because it already has the logistics, uh, it already has the relationship with Djibouti. Uh, the, I understand that the port fees are very high, uh, but you negotiate, you talk about that. And if relations with, with Eritrea is getting better, Assab is also a possibility. It's close to uh, central um, Ethiopia, where the, uh, the industrial parks are. And so that's what you do. You don't threaten anybody. Uh, you don't make reckless statements that can reignite conflict in an already turbulent region. That helps nobody. So th th that's what I think they need to do. Uh, sit down and renegotiate uh, the port fees in Djibouti, um, talk to Eritrea, try and uh, get access to uh, the ports in Masawa and uh, Asab, um, and then maybe look at the Lamu option. Uh, but Bebera, uh, you really have to be careful how you do that, because uh, that will be de facto recognition of a, a, a succeeding country. Kamal, what, what are you, as a, as a member of the Ethiopian parliament, make of these reports that Eritrea was offered a stake in Ethiopian Airlines in return for a deal over its port in, in Asab? I understand that deal is now off the table, but, but what do you make of the fact that it was even discussed? Uh, well, I think uh, I would speak of uh, the situation from the Ethiopian side. You know, the fact that Ethiopia is not, is not accessing to a port was unfair and unfortunate. Um, uh, Ethiopia will do whatever is possible for the peaceful users to access to a port. Uh, I see guests are speaking of options to the neighboring countries. So I'm very sure that, that the, camp, the government will check on the other neighboring countries in any way that they can access to a very new relationship. Uh, the nation sure that they can give anything we have as a country in return of accessing to, uh, to a port. As the situation with Eritrea, you know, what is the discussion, where is it going on? I think they're going to be very official, and which uh, I can't have a, a word on it, but I'm pretty much sure that uh, the government will do whatever is possible in, in a very crucial manner to access the port. And it doesn't matter again from Eritrea. Or Somalia, you know, or Djibouti, like accessing their port is 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 very mandatory, given given the situation now where we are going, and as the fact of about uh, the navy and everything, and also the palace in uh, Matthew Eller mentioned. Let's let's have the fact, you know, Ethiopia is in the verge of growth, in a very world class standard, like it's being very proactive. Make sure that the nation states you know things of one step ahead to make sure that everything we do in the world class be very proactive uh, to whatever comes and to make sure that all infrastructures, including security and development, are in a very world class standard. And I don't see why that worries anyone mm -hmm. of being proactive, uh, whether it is um, at the Navy or any other development. So I think they should be welcomed in a very positive okay. manner. And, and we, should, we need to give the credit for being that. Uh, the leading government. Martin, wh what do you make of, of those reports about um, the, the stake in Ethiopian Airlines being offered to, to Eritrea? And, 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 and do you want to, you, you started to, to expand upon, or would you like to expand upon your thoughts about where Ethiopia would want to site this port? Well, I mean, uh, I think if I was an Eritrean, I'd be delighted to have a stake in as successful a project as Ethiopian Airlines. It's one of the uh, really successful airlines in Africa. Once it was, uh, you know, fighting with Kenyan Airlines, South African Airlines, but it's streets ahead of everybody else now. And it is, is fantastically well run. It was, certainly was until very recently. And uh, let's see. I mean, I, I would be very happy to have that if I was an Eritrean, but I, I would be surprised if Ethiopia was prepared to give it up. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I still think that the, the port of Assab, which has been lying essentially unused since uh, the uh, border war 
1998 to 2000 with, with Eritrea. Uh, and all you have to do is basically rehabilitate it, put, send back the Ethiopians who used to live there and used to act as the stevedores, and uh, provide, would provide a lot of uh, employment locally. It would be a great idea, and it would earn money for the Eritreans. And there's one other thing, which is that there's a huge potash deposit on the border between Eritrea and Ethiopia in the, uh, in the uh, um, Afar region. And there's no reason why that should not be developed. Now, the Chinese have taken a big stake in it. That would mean building another port, probably, because it's such a big project. It's a 200-year project. So there are lots of things that they could cooperate on, but it does require talking and waving a big stick and saying you're going to use force is not the way forward. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned China, Martin. What about um, uh, Gulf nations and their continuing engagement in, in the Horn of Africa? What does that mean for Ethiopia's plans? Well, it does mean that, that you know, they are competitors, but, I mean, you know, they're competitors with everybody. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the UAE has huge investments in a lot of the ports. For example, they had a, a big stake in, in Djibouti. They've got stakes in uh, the, the, the Somali ports. And, uh, yes, of course, you'd, you'd have to... You, you've got to fight for your commercial rights, shall we say, within this. But, I mean, these should be peaceful competitions, and there's no reason why uh, the other the ports shouldn't be developed and should become uh, very successful. I mean, the Horn of Africa has huge potential, uh, but it does need to learn to live with itself in a peaceful way. And if that can happen, there's no reason why, why it shouldn't develop uh, and, and become a real uh, boon to the whole of Africa. Uh Kwako, as, as Martin was saying, that you know the, the region has huge potential. Is is large scale economic integration? Uh, do you think a, a, a possibility at least in the near future, or a pipe dream? Uh, can neighbouring nations benefit from from Ethiopia's rapid economic growth, uh, riding on its coattails? Absolutely. And Ethiopia is the largest country over there, 120 million people expected uh, to double in population in 30 years. Uh, the economy is growing. And because it needs uh, its neighbors, uh, because it doesn't have access to the, the sea, uh, there is interdependence built into that relationship. And so, uh, with a little bit of uh, creative thinking, uh, you could have a regional economy that works for everybody. Um, and they need to um, talk. And Ethiopia cannot be threatening anybody. It already has problems with uh, Egypt uh, over the dam. It doesn't need any more conflict. And so, regional organizations like, you know, IGAD needs to get involved. Uh, they've been talking a lot about uh, promoting uh, regional trade, uh, the Africa uh, continental free trade area initiatives. Um, everybody talks about promoting uh, intra-African trade. This is this is uh, a golden opportunity uh, to uh, to solve problems and create jobs for everybody in the region, and everybody can benefit um, if uh, if they work together. Uh, oh. So no, we, we don't need threats. We don't need conflict. All right, Kwaku. If, if if we assume for a moment that his comments were directed at at a, at a domestic audience, they weren't for for international con consumption. Uh, you mentioned uh, you know tension with uh, with Egypt. Uh, do you think that Abiy Abid is is the man to you know while, while his his plans are are perhaps uh, necessary uh, as far as economic growth in Ethiopia is concerned? Uh, do you think that Abiy Abid is is the man who can who can negotiate a a, a a deal, the right deal for Ethiopia and the region? Well, he did win a Nobel Peace Prize, so I hope that he can. <laughs> um, make peace again. He's made peace with uh, neighbors uh, before. He made peace with uh, Eritrea. He made peace with uh, Sudan. He made peace with Djibouti. So he can do so again. And I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, people uh, in his, in his uh, party at home are encouraging him to seek cooperation. Uh, and also, remember, he made this uh, statement uh, uh, in front of uh, investors. No foreign investor wants to move to a region where there is conflict. And so this is one of the ways to scale off uh, uh, that foreign direct investment. He needs to uh, stop that talk and figure out how to make peace. And I think that because he's made peace in the past, he can do so again. Martin, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, one of the interesting things is uh, actually the relationship with Egypt has now improved. 
uh, they have agreed to find some way of dealing with the, the key issue, which is the Grand Renaissance Dam, which was built on the Blue Nile, and which the Egyptians and the Sudanese were very worried about. But it's only a hydroelectric dam. It's not going to use the water for uh, Ethiopian irrigation. So the, the, the Egyptians now seem to be a bit more happy about it. And it's going to produce a lot of electricity, some of which will be available in Sudan, maybe further afield. And so you begin to see an alternative for Ethiopia where it ties into the region, develops the region, works with the region, and is a dynamo for growth. And that is certainly a possibility. But you know, one of the big problems is that uh, the, one of the neighbors in, in Eritrea, President Isas, is very unpredictable. And you can never be sure when he's going to stir up conflict again. So uh, you know, it, it's a tough region, hard to work in. But it can be done, and Ethiopia, uh, you know, is could be a bastion of 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 both uh, development and peace if it's led in the right way. But I I, I come back, Martin, uh, to the, my very first question, the question I asked some 25 minutes ago uh, about whether the the prime minister should be should be taken seriously here. Uh, here, obviously not. Well, you always have to take a prime minister seriously, but I would always judge people more by their actions than by their words. Let's not forget that when they uh, uh, fomented a war against Tigray, they plotted it for two years. It was a two-year preparation by Ethiopia and Eritrea to attack Tigray. They never mentioned it. So let's look at the, the actions rather than the words. OK. There, gentlemen, I'm afraid we have to end it. Many thanks to you all, Kamal Hashi Mahamud, uh, Martin Plout, and Kwaku Nuama. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.